Uh, our next speaker is Jose Brunner, Professor Jose Brunner. He uh, holds a joint appointment as full professor at the Lupin Faculty of Law and the Cohen Institute for the History and Philosophy of Science and Ideas, both at Tel Aviv University. Currently, he's the director of the Cohen Institute. The law faculty, he also an academic supervisor of Israel's first legal clinic for the rights of Holocaust survivors and the elderly, which he helped establish in 2011. And my co-supervisor is Daphne. <laughs> Thank you. And he's a senior faculty fellow at the Edmund Safra Center for Ethics. Wunder's main areas of research and publication include the relationship between law, memory, and identity, the right to the truth, the history of the compensation for Holocaust survivors in Germany and Israel, the history and politics of psychoanalysis, the politics of the mental health discourse on trauma, psychological theories of Nazism and genocide, and diverse topics in modern and contemporary political thought. His lecture is titled, The Plays the Thing Wherein I'll Catch the cons Conscience of the King, Psychoanalysis as a Pagan Game. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, I wasn't with Safra for the last five years, only for the last two years. But uh, Shai and I did other things together before, including editing a volume and uh, touring Germany to uh, launch it. So I'm really happy I had also these two years in additional cooperation, and I hope there will be more in the future. Uh, what I want to talk about today is the ethics of psychoanalytic practice. And uh, I will do this from a particular angle that you will become, I think, more clear uh, as I go on. Uh, and when I speak of psychoanalysis within the confines of this talk, I will only speak about Freud. There is no way, of course, to speak about the whole canon of psychoanalysis. Freud lays out the ethical task of psychoanalysis in the concluding passage of Studies on Hysteria, his first book, which he wrote together with his mentor and colleague, Joseph Breuer. This is the passage. I do not doubt that it would be easier for fate to take away your suffering than it would be for me. But you will see for yourself that much has been gained if you succeed in turning your historical misery into common unhappiness. With a mental life that has been restored to health, you will be better armed against that unhappiness. The task of psychoanalysis, then, is an ethical one insofar as it aims to diminish suffering by restoring health of neurotics who would be condemned to misery to hysterical misery, enabling them to reach a state of common unhappiness, but not only that, but also enabling them to cope with their common unhappiness. Freud's description of the aims of psychoanalytic practice in these terms may differ from the vocabulary of philosophers who tend to speak of the good life in terms of happiness, excellence, authenticity, or human flourishing. As Freud points out in Civilization and Discontent, it seems to him that, I quote, the intention that man should be happy is not included in the plan of creation." End of quote. Ultimately, however, the difference between Freud and the philosophers are not that significant. For like them, he's concerned with a practice that can help people to attain the best possible life, with finding a practice that will make it possible to live a life that humans will experience as worth living. As philosophers have done from Aristotle onwards, Freud suggests a method by which the goal that he lays out in the simple and sober terms of health and common unhappiness can be reached. Moreover, by a good many, like a good many philosophers, philosophers before him, he postulates that a particular form of dialogue can help humans to reach the best possible lives. However, since he regarded neurosis rather than a philosophically misguided approach as the obstacle to a full life, he invented a new profession with an institutional structure and a theoretical framework of its own, all of which were to serve the goal of curing neurotics. The American Nobel Prize winning theoretical physicist Richard Feynman is reported to have said that the philosophy of science is as useful to scientists as ornithology is to birds. Psychoanalysts are neither birds nor scientists. Ever since the inception of this new profession, there have been analysts who sought to bridge the gap to philosophy and philosophers who sought to conceptualize psychoanalytic practice in their terms. The thinkers on both sides have undertaken attempts to place psychoanalytic practice in a broader philosophical mode of thinking about human interaction, knowledge, and truth. The purposes of bringing psychoanalysis and philosophy together are manifold. 
to facilitate methodological self-reflection, to achieve legitimation, to make explicit unspoken and perhaps unrecognized assumptions, to point to commonalities and differences with other therapeutic endeavors or forms of understanding of human conduct, to uncover logics, and to point to <coughs> ethical consequences. Some analysts and philosophers consider psychoanalytic practice primarily as a hermeneutic enterprise, as for instance the French phenomenologist Paul Ricoeur has done. Ricoeur has stressed that the task of the analyst has to do primarily with language and meaning. He foregrounded the fact that it aims at interpretation, seeks to understand the deeper unconscious meaning of the analysis, utterances and behavior, weaving them into a coherent narrative. Others who seek to place psychoanalytic practice within the realm of science have entered into a dialogue with the American philosopher of science, Adolf Grunbaum, who has examined psychoanalytic construction and interpretations as testable propositions to be validated by empirical evidence that can be gained, in his view, in the analytic setting. Over the years, much of the debate on the validity of psychoanalytic practice has focused on the question of whether it primarily seeks to arrive at coherent narratives or produce and test causal hypotheses, and whether it has to borrow its standards from one or the other of these two domains. The German social theorist Jürgen Habermas has suggested to regard psychoanalysis as a third type of practice, with knowledge constituting interests and criteria of validity of its own, which cannot be assimilated either to traditional hermeneutics or to the empirical or analytical sciences. He proclaimed psychoanalytic practice to be driven by an emancipatory interest and to be methodologically self-reflective. I concur with Habermas and others working within the tradition of the Frankfurt School that while psychoanalytic interpretations may have both causal and hermeneutic aspects, they are neither hypotheses that analysts arrive at on the basis of clinical data, nor the result of exegetical exercises performed on the analysis utterances. However, Habermas is less convincing when he presents psychoanalysis as the prime example of an emancipatory science that proceeds by means of a rational dialogue enabling methodological self-reflection. Habermas' reading of Freud leaves us with a picture of a pale analytic setting a philosopher's fantasy that is devoid of conflict, subterfuge, secret, sexuality, authority, and dependence. More recently, the French philosopher and religious thinker Emmanuel Levinas has been popular with analysts. In recent years, some of them have claimed that Levinas' ethical theory, which stresses uniqueness, responsibility, empathy, and compassion, and focuses on the face-to-face -face encounter with the other, is most relevant for a philosophical understanding of psychoanalytic practice. Though responsibility for another person constitutes certainly a pillar of psychoanalytic practice, it is also based on the assumption that the analyst is hiding something from herself in her unconscious, and that the analyst has been hired to help her discover what she's hiding and how she's hiding it so successfully that she can't access her secret, although it makes her ill and imposes suffering on her. To make conscious what hitherto has remained unconscious is indeed the central task of psychoanalytic practice a task that can certainly not be achieved by empathy alone. Hence, rather than by an ethic of compassion, much of psychoanalytic listening is guided by an attempt to note and decipher clues to ideas and affects analysis may both hide and reveal. Paul Ricoeur has highlighted this element of psychoanalytic practice when he described it as a hermeneutics of suspicion, awarding Freud together with Marx and Nietzsche the title of being the great, one of the great masters of suspicion. Such aspects of psychoanalytic practice, as well as the fact that it is a professional service that is performed against payment and according to strict rules, are lost in the romanticizing Levinasian vocabulary of compassion and care. So I've outlined four approaches, the scientific, hermeneutic, emancipatory, and romantic. In what follows, I present the work of the French post-structuralist philosopher Jean-Francois Lyotard as providing a fifth alternative philosophical reference, an agonistic one, what that means will be clearer in the course of my presentation, that I hold to offer a fruitful conceptual frame for psychoanalytic practice as one that is designed to, main, to make conscious what is unconscious, leading to original conclusion as to the ethical obligation of the analyst vis-a-vis -vis the analysant. While the philosophical approaches that I have mentioned so far may offer some food of thought, 
as I have shown, something that will be shown to be essential in psychoanalytic practice is lost in all of them, while it is captured well by Lyotard's thinking. Now, as I said, I will limit myself to Freud. So, in the opening sentences of an article on the beginning of treatment that Freud published in 1913, he states, anyone who hopes to learn the noble game of chess from books will soon discover that only the openings and end games admit of an exhaustive systematic presentation, and that the infinite variety of moves which develop after the opening defy any such description. This gap in instruction can only be filled by diligent study of games fought out by masters. The rules which can be laid down for the practice of psychoanalytic treatment are subject to similar limitations. Chess, as you know, is a most sophisticated game with simple rules. It has provided a source for analogies for a number of philosophers, among them Wittgenstein and Lyotard. In contrast to card games, both partners have exactly the same pieces. All of them are arranged in the same way, placed in the open and visible to both sides. Since there is no dice, there is no room for chance or luck. Victory and defeat are a result of concentration and strategy which may involve gambit, that is a tactic in which a piece is sacrificed to gain an advantage, or other calculated and deceptive moves, as long as these are performed according to the rules of the game, in the open, as it were. As everybody knows, learning the rules of a game isn't enough to play the game well, to enjoy it, and to win. Excellence in chess is not a matter of knowing and applying, and applying rules and norms. It demands, above all, experience, intuition, intelligence, a good grasp of the situation and its opportunities, foresight, tactical genius, as well as knowledge of the weaknesses and strengths of one's opponent. By drawing a parallel between learning how to play chess to learning how to practice psychoanalysis, that is, how to make conscious what is unconscious, Freud presents the latter as a game rather than a science. In introduces agonistic, that is, adversarial, conflictual elements of struggle, deception, and strategy into the analytic setting, addresses the techniques and limitations of psychoanalytic training and instruction, and invokes the role of masters, whose exemplary games are supposed to serve as paradigmatic examples, inspiring those who wish to learn how to play the psychoanalytic game well. Moreover, in the passage that you can see here, Freud refers to what analysts do as moves in a game. While the ground rules of the psychoanalytic games more or less remain the same, analysts are to play psychoanalysis as chess players play chess, who would be ill-advised to transpose a game plan from analysis to analysis on the basis of a principle or norm, for they would be bound to lose if they did so. And in contrast to chess, this means that their analysis would lose too. The heterogeneity of analysis and hence of analytic games make it imper imperative for, anal for analysts to think in cases, which is the basic way in which psychoanalysts think. That is to publish and study case studies that may constitute paradigmatic examples from which no general rules of practice can be deduced. Hence the lasting role that Freud's case studies play in the canon of psychoanalysis until today, where the moves of the master are retold, discussed, scrutinized, and criticized in a great many publications. The psychoanalytic practice is best understood as a game, and a pagan game at that, in the sense in which Lyotard used this term. Lyotard developed the, nation, the notion of paganism in Lessons on Paganism, Just Gaming, and various other works of the late 70s. The term paganism refers to the way of thinking that takes into account and strives to do justice to incommensurable differences, excellence, in pagan games stems from adopting a playful attitude, from learning by inspiration from great examples rather than by strict rule following, and from being flexible and insightful into the intentions of one's opponent. Just as pagan religions believe in a number of different gods rather than just one god, Lyotard's pagan philosophy represents a concern for difference, pluralism, and multiplicity, terms he uses synonymously to oppose the idea of universality. This opposition, which Lyotard shares with Levinas, stems from a basic commitment to an ontology of singular events. If reality is constituted by unique happenings, then there is no universal law of judgment, 
that can take account of each and every event in a way that does them all justice. Paganism in the Leotarian sense of the world suggests that there are irreducible differences in the order of things, and that you must take things on their own terms without attempting them to reduce them to universals. The Leotarian perspective that I sketched here accentuates that psychoanalytic interpretations differ from hermeneutics as practiced in literature and other text-oriented disciplines in that they do not seek to reveal hidden features of an inert, finished, closed text. Psychoanalytic interpretations are moves in an ongoing verbal game, tactical interventions that aim to impact on the next verbal moves of the analysant. At the same time, psychoanalytic interventions differ from scientific propositions in that they are unique and not reproducible. Of course, they can be registered and quoted in writing as moves on the board of chess can be represented by drawings, letters, and numbers, thus allowing games to be replayed in order to learn them. But the actual role and effect of interpretations are limited to the particular dialogical relationship in which they are made. So far, I've accentuated the game-like character of analytic practice. Before proceeding to another analogy, let me point to an aspect of psychoanalysis that distinguishes it from other competitive games. I've alluded to it before and turns it into an ethical practice. Though all games involve rules, strategy, and the context of, and the context of wills, usually competitive games follow a zero-sum logic. Only one of the opponents can win. In contrast, psychoanalytic practice is a positive, a positive sum game in which the victory of the analyst implies a gain in health of the analyzant. Using Lyotard to stress the centrality of the agonistic, the playful analytic practice, runs counter the prevalent philosophical approaches to psychoanalysis. Hence, it is necessary to add some strength to this argument by claiming that it not only conforms well to Freud's own presentation of analytic practice in analogies to, ch to chess, but also his representation of analytic practice as, to speak with Clausewitz, a continuation of war by other means. It may come as a surprise to you to hear that the language of warfare provided Freud with the largest repertoire of metaphors and analogies to describe analytic practice. But this simply is the case. He turned the bellicose term resistance into a central component of his discourse on analytic practice. Already in studies on hysteria, Freud described the work of the analyst in the language of strategy. Here is the quote I'm referring to. We force our way into the internal strata, overcoming resistances all the time. We experiment how far we can advance with our present means. We are constantly making up arrears. By this method, we at last reach a point at which we can stop working in strata and can penetrate by a main path straight to the nucleus of the pathogenic organization. With this, the struggle is won. Though not yet ended, but now the patient helps us energetically. His resistance is for the most part broken. Freud repeatedly defined the task of treatment as that of combating resistances. He depicted the analytic process as a prolonged confrontation between analyst and analysand, in which, I quote, the analysand brings out of the armory of the past the weapons with which he defends himself against the progress of treatment. Weapons which we must wrest from him, one by one. End of quote. As Freud explained, in analytic warfare, and here goes another quote, the length of the path of development and the wealth of the material are not the decisive factors. It is more a question of whether the path is clear. An army can be held up for weeks on a stretch of country, which in peacetime an express train crosses in a couple of hours, if the army has to overcome the enemy's resistance there. And in his 1912 article on the dynamics of transference, he elaborates on this image by, explain, by explaining the following that you can see, he can see here. If in the course of the battle there is a particularly embittled, embittered struggle over the possession of some little church or some individual farm, and I remind you this is in order to explain transference, this is in order to explain therapy, this is not Freud on warfare or something like that. There is no need to suppose, suppose that the church is a national shrine, perhaps, or that the house shelters the army's pages. The value of the object may be a purely tactical one and may perhaps emerge only in this one battle. 
In the postmodern condition, Lyotard argues that the contemporary world can best be understood from the perspective of, of linguistics and communication, emphasizing the, pra the pragmatic aspects of both. It is in this context that he introduces the notion of agonistics, by which he refers to discourses, relations, and frameworks that involve strategies for winning over an adversary. It's also there that he states, to speak is to fight in the sense of playing, and speech acts fall within the domain of a general agonistics. In this approach, Lyotard joins other post-structural theorists, such as Jean Baudrillard and Michel Foucault, in highlighting the creative potential and the human need to fight and play, as a number of thinkers from Heraclitus, who said, war is the father of all things, to Nietzsche did through the ages. Lyotard is quick to point out, against Habermas, not only that consensus is not a worthy goal because verbal conflict is creative, but also that it makes no sense to try to set limit to agonistic communication. As we have seen, Freud's view of the analyst and analyst dialogue and of analytic practice in general is in complete accordance with this agonistic view of communication. Moreover, in his eyes, psychoanalytic practice is predicated upon the fact that humans cannot stop communicating, even if they wish to do so. They never really shut up. At best, they change their mode of communication. Here, Freud on Dora. When I set myself the task of bringing to light what humans keep hidden within them, I thought the task was harder, a harder one than, I, than it really is. He that has eyes to see and ears to hear may convince himself that no mortal can keep a secret. If his lips are silent, he chatters with his fingertips. Betrayal oozes out of him at every pore. And thus the task of making conscious the most hidden recesses of the mind is quite possible to accomplish. So what is this war that Freud is talking about? It's a civil war in which the analyst intervenes as an external ally. He's intervening as an ally of the ego, which has been weakened, here another quote, by the internal conflict. We must come to its aid. The position is like a civil war, which if it is hoped will be decided by the help of an ally from without. The analytical physician and the weakened ego of the patient basing themselves upon the real external world are to combine against the enemies, the instinctual claims of the id and the moral claims of the superego. We form a pact with each other. This pact constitutes the analytic situation. So we have another agonistic situation in which the victory of one is the victory of all. Because if the analyst supports the ego and the ego wins, it's a win for the whole subject, for the whole analysant. So we have a chess game in which the win of one is the win of all, and we have a war in which the win of one is a, the victory of one is a victory of all. Which brings me to the quote in the title of my presentation. In Shakespeare's play, Hamlet, the Prince of Denmark, from which a sentence in the title of this paper has been taken, wants to unmask his uncle, King Claudius, who succeeded his brother, Hamlet's father, to the throne and married his wife after murdering him. Typical Freudian uh, constellation, as most Shakespearean constellations are. For this purpose, Hamlet asks traveling players to put on a play, The Murder of Gonzago, so that when King Claudius watches, a murder takes place on stage, and the murder takes place on stage, his emotional response will reveal his guilt, which will thus become visible to all. So when Hamlet tells us the plays the thing wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king, what he says is that he uses the theater play as a pawn in a strategy designed to reveal the truth about the crime. The play is deployed in an agonistic struggle for the truth. However, in order to elicit the response he's seeking, Hamlet has to alter some of the lines of the play. He considers that the standard text, which has been repeated time and ag again on stage, will not be effective. Thus Hamlet ends up with a play that in this particular form is played only once and addressed at an audience of one only, his murderous uncle Claudius. The ruse works, his uncle cannot stand to watch the play and has to leave. Hamlet uses a play that is words, not simply to entertain, but as moves in a struggle. And hence he has to alter the lines, as to, as to make them fit the audience over whom he seeks to gain victory. 
It is by creating a singular play that Hamlet catches the king's conscience. He illustrates dramatically the agonistic vision that Lyotard speaks of philosophically. So what ethical postulates arise from this? First, that analysts meet every analysand anew and create a game plan specific for their specific case, eschewing the search for a universal principle by which different analysands can be treated. And second, that they regard themselves as players who have been hired to engage in a battle of words, whose aim is to make conscious what is unconscious in order to diminish suffering. Thus, rather than closing psychoanalytic practice in an ethics of compassion and care, as, Levinasian, as the Levinasian approach does, or an emancipatory vision as Habermas would have it, a Lyotarian ethics of psychoanalytic practice regards analytic setting as a framework for agonistic encounters in which two opponents fight each other with words. But by the victory of one, the analyst also means an increase of health in the other. At the same time, the stress of the Lyotarian view, the stress that the Lyotarian view places on the heterogeneity of analytic encounters distinguish psychoanalysis from scientific endeavors as well as from hermeneutic enterprises. Conjoining these two postulates, the uniqueness and the agonistic, the ethics that emerge from Lyotard's work proposes that using the same play, uh, the same uh, strategy for different patients would not only be ineffective, but also unethical. <laughs>